This morning, we're gonna take a look at, at an event in the Old Testament that took place in the lives of the children of Israel. But, but I think that we're gonna be taking a, a look at an event that takes place in the lives of maybe each and every one of us as well. I thank God that his word does not change. Um, the reactions of God's people do not change. Um, humanity does not change, but I thank God that his word uh, is, is forever and it is sure. And it has been preserved over the centuries so that we can learn um, about the way in which God deals with his people. Do you ever wonder, God, what are you doing? Um, we can see God's handiwork um, on display all throughout the scriptures. And so if you have your Bibles uh, with you, let's turn together to the book of Exodus. Let's go to Genesis, turn right. And uh, right before you hit the Leviticus, it's going to be right there. Exodus chapter 13, and uh, we're going to be kind of parked in Exodus um, this morning. Now, um, to, to really appreciate um, where Israel is at in the text that we'll be uh, looking at this morning. We, we need to understand where Israel has been. Their journey has been full of all kinds of surprises, uh, both good and bad, disappointing and, and exciting. Um, as we enter into the book of Genesis, uh, Exodus, right at the beginning, um, we see that the, the, the people of Israel, they are growing. They are blossoming, they are multiplying, they're becoming a more uh, influential force. Uh, and there was a Pharaoh who really was not happy about that, not wanting uh, his own influence perhaps to be diluted, not wanting to share the power with uh, probably, a, uh, there's probably a whole host of, of reasons why uh, Pharaoh was not wanting to see uh, the, the growth and the success and the, the thriving of the children of Israel. And so he begins to suppress um, the children of Israel and, and, and hold them back. In fact, as they continued to multiply, uh, the, he puts a mandate out that the firstborn male was to be thrown into the Nile, thinking we would get rid of them by slowly killing them off uh, as, as infants. And so it was a very um, oppressing um, time for the, the children of Israel. And they are, they are obviously crying out to God for, for a deliverer. They want to be free. They want to be able to worship God freely. But the, the demands of the Pharaoh continue to become more unreasonable and overbearing and prevented them from really uh, worshiping the Lord and, and just enjoying the life that, and freedom that God wanted them to have. And so they, they cried out for, for a deliverer. And we see that, that Moses is born. And Moses, because of the mandate that was already in place by the Pharaoh, the instruct was to put him in the Nile. And, and so we recognize that what happens is Moses is placed um, into a basket into the, the Nile River. And, and, you know, sometimes the familiarity of stories can cause us to kind of move on to the next point. How many mothers would feel comfortable putting their child in the Nile River, right? And so, but, but, they, but they knew God had a plan. And, and so what, what they do is they put Moses in this, in this basket in the, the Nile River. And the Hollywood version of this is really probably a lot more um, exciting on one level. As you know, We get this picture in our mind of, of Moses going through what was like, remember the movie The Perfect Storm? You know, the waves are like, you know, pouring all over and the wind is blowing. And, and there's Moses and there's the baby in the basket and he's kind of going miles. And it, it, that sounds real exciting but that really wasn't um, the way it was played out. Um, it makes for a good Sunday school lesson. And, but in the end of the day, really what happened was he was placed in this basket and he was strategically placed in, uh, to move in a location where Pharaoh's daughter was known to bathe. Now, if that takes the miraculous out of it for you, uh, um, it shouldn't. I mean, because any mother who'd be willing to even do that is a miracle, right? And so, um, but that's what they do. They take Moses and they place him in the basket and, and they set him in the location where they knew that, that Pharaoh's daughter was going to be. And she happens to be there as they expected. And she looks and she sees the basket and she opens 
the basket and she sees Moses and she is smitten with this little precious little baby boy and she loves on him right away and she recognizes I can't possibly let anything happen to this this child. And so Moses' sister, who's probably watching all of this playing out, making sure that the target reached its intended goal, right? Now the baby is in the arms of Pharaoh's daughter, goes and says to her, hey, listen, this is, prob- this is one of the children of the Hebrews. And it was good that she said that just in case Pharaoh's daughter thought it's common to think that babies are floating in baskets in the Nile, right? Um, So she just figured, let me just give you this little, let me fill in the blank for you as to why the child might be in the basket. This is a, this is a, this is one of the children of the Hebrews. And she says to Pharaoh's daughter, do you want me to go and grab one of the, um, one of the nursing moms from, from, from the Hebrews to take care of of the child and she's given permission to do that. And so she goes and she, she takes, um, she gets a hold of, of Jochebed, Moses' mom. And Moses' mom, Jochebed, is, is reunited with her baby as she pulls him to his breast and she is nursing her child and seeing and knowing, I'm sure, in her heart, God has a plan for this precious little boy. And so she's able to watch him grow in the king's courts. Uh, he is being raised, by, raised up by God to, to deliver the people of Israel from the slavery that they were in under the Egyptians. God had a plan for Moses, and God had a plan for the children of Israel. Now, as we move through the book of Exodus, we see the people of God, they are, they are crying out for deliverance. They are, it is getting worse and worse as time is going on. So on one side, we, we have Moses that is growing and, and learning and becoming wiser and stronger. And, and yet at the same time, we recognize that, that it's getting worse and worse for the children of Israel. And they are crying out to God for deliverance. And God taps Moses and says, go to the Pharaoh and you tell him, let my people go. We know that story. And so Moses, after some discussion, recognizes, obviously, this is what God wants him to do. You know the story. And so Moses approaches Pharaoh and says, let my people go. And Pharaoh's like, no. And so God backs up the call to let the people go by sending consequences for disobedience. And we see the plagues are then laid out um, one by one to the Egyptians. We first, we see that the, the water is turned to blood everywhere they go. Could you imagine what that must have been like? Imagine to be in the middle of drinking a cup of water when that miracle took place, like water, 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 blood, you know? Um, it must have been crazy everywhere they looked, there's blood all over the place, and, but that wasn't enough. It, it, might have, it certainly got their attention, but it wasn't enough to, to, to initiate the full release, and so God, sends another plague, a plague of frogs. How many love frogs, right? Maybe you love frogs, but probably wouldn't love frogs if everywhere you went, every place you stepped, every place that you ate, there were frogs everywhere, right? And so they'd go into their refrigerator, there'd be frogs. They used the microwave, there was frogs, right? They pour out their Cheerios, frogs. Everywhere they go, there's frogs everywhere. And, and they're like, really, it's gotta get their attention. Something is very froggy around here. Nothing is good for us. And so, but there's, it's still not enough to get their attention. And so then God, God sends gnats. The only thing I hate more than frogs is gnats, right? Because gnats are so small, you can't see them. The only reason you know they're there is because they just bit you, right? And so gnats are everywhere. People are being bit, and, and yet it's still not enough to get the people to turn. And so God sends flies, I hate flies. Flies are disgusting. They, they eat your food, they spit it up, and they eat it again. And, and, you're, and, it's just, and then you eat it. And they, they fly away. You didn't know they were there, but then you eat that. And it's, uh, flies are disgusting, but when, fly, when it's a plague of flies, you're, they're unavoidable. They're everywhere. And, and yet it still it wasn't enough to get them to turn. And so we see that the next plague is the 
all the livestock, the Egyptian livestock die. God's hitting them in their purses, right? That was where, that's where their, that was their provision. That was their, that's what they ate. That's how they, that's how they survived. And, and, and yet it got their attention for a little while, but, but not enough for them to fully turn. And so we see the next plague is boils begin to break out on man and beast. How disgusting that must have looked, especially if there were some flies and gnats still lingering around, right? And, and so, I mean, let's not forget, I know it's morning, but um, but I mean, it's disgusting. They're seeing the visual display of their disobedience to God as boils are breaking out and it causes a moment of pause, but then he changes once again. And so then God sends hail and hail comes down upon Egypt in ways that Egypt has never experienced. It brings complete destruction and livestock are killed and trees are knocked over and, and, and there's just devastation across the land and they call out and they say, all right, Pharaoh, listen, all right, you win, we'll let you go and the hail stops. But he reneges again on his decision to let the children of Israel go and, and worship and so God sends locusts to the earth. Remember years ago when the locusts had come? How many are old enough to remember when we had that invasion back like in the 80s? Like everywhere you went, those things were nasty looking things. And it was like all of a sudden it was like, it was a tree. I never saw such bark on a tree and you look close and it's like, it's all locusts. It was absolutely disgusting. But they experienced locusts um, so much so that it, that it darkened the daytime. For the, for the Egyptians. In fact, whatever greenery that, that, that survived from the hell was eaten up by the locusts. And, and, so, but, and it caused a moment of pause once again, but still not enough. And so God sends darkness to cover the land. Darkness, not just for one day, not just for two days, but, but for three days, Egypt is in total darkness. People couldn't leave their homes. They are, they are in total darkness. And what's interesting is the only place that there was not darkness in Egypt is where the children of Israel dwelt. Because at the moment they were the light of the world. But it wasn't able to, it wasn't really able to catch, it wasn't, you know, sending the message with full impact in such a way that it was causing them to turn back. And so once again, he, he reneges and finally, God, in this 10th plague, sends the death angel to go and take out the firstborn of every home. And he gives the instruction for the children of Israel that before the death angel comes, you make sure you, you celebrate the Passover where they'll slaughter a lamb and they'll take the blood and they'll put it on the door of the Hebrew home. And so when the death angel came, they would see the blood and they would literally pass over that home and not bring death. What a beautiful picture of we who were dead in our trespasses and sins. We who were born under the wrath of God according to the scripture. But then we come to Christ and the blood of Jesus Christ is applied to our life. And when God comes and brings the wrath that the scripture says he's going to bring upon the earth, when he comes upon you and me, he's gonna see not the blood on the door, but the blood of Jesus on your life, and he's going to pass over you. And instead of receiving death, we receive life, and we see um, a beautiful picture of the work of Christ right in the Passover celebration. But this was the final act. This was the final plague. It gets the attention of Pharaoh. And he's like, finally, you know what? Just, just you and your kids and your, your mother-in-law, get, get out of here. Everybody just, just go. And he, he, he wants them just out of Egypt. Go and worship. Do whatever you got to do. Just, stu- just don't be here. And so he, he sends them out. And the children of Israel go. And they, they finally go to, to worship. Could you, could you imagine what that must have been like for the children of Israel? I mean, there's nothing like when God's got your back. You know, when you're getting bullied by some big pharaoh and, and God steps up big and he's got your back and he, and he, and he, and he protects you and preserves you and, 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 and takes care of the big old nasty bully for you. And so it was an exciting time for Israel 
Let's pick up in our story, verse 17 of chapter 13. It says, <clears throat> Now when, when, when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. This is a very significant thing for us to kind of get a hold of this morning. God didn't take them the easy way because these former slaves that had come out of slavery still had the mindset of slaves. And God knew that they weren't ready to go into the land of Philistines because he knew that if, he, if they saw the challenges that were going to be presented to them in the land of the Philistines, the first thing they wanted to, would want to do was to go back to, the, back to Egypt so they could be slaves again. And so God, knowing where they're at, knowing what they were capable of, capable of knowing what, what their makeup was of that moment, Although it was near, it was logical, it made sense to go the quick way, he brings them the other way because he knew that if they went that way, they'd be begging for slavery. Give us slavery. God didn't take them the easy way because they still had the mindset of slaves. God knew where they were at. And he was more committed to them as individuals and as a people then he was their comfort level and what they thought would be the right way. You see, God was committed to making them ready for what was ahead. And the way he did that was by, by bringing them the long way around the wilderness. It was this choice of direction that God made for them that would cause them to learn how to trust God in the most difficult of times. You see, for them, the, the going by way of the land of the Philistines, it made sense. It was the quick way. How many like the quick way sometimes? It was the logical way. It was the way that just made total sense in their limited understanding. The problem was, you see, what they saw was the land. What God saw was the Philistines. God knew that they weren't ready to go that direction, and God was committed in, in, to, their, to, their, to the long haul for them and making sure that they would learn the character of God that they didn't have at the moment that they wouldn't be able to endure as they went through the land of the Philistines. Somebody's got a phone call. <laughs> God's not committed to the quick fix. He's committed to the long haul because the longer, the longer things take, the deeper things go and the more settled you become in your faith. I've been in trials and so have you. I, I know, I like when I've got a fast trial. I'm in, I'm out, I'm out of here, I'm moving on. But then there's those other trials, you know them, where it's gonna take a little while to push through this one. You're going to have to cry a little bit on this one. You're going to have to trust in ways you've never had to trust before. You're going to have to lean on one another in ways you've never had to trust before, lean on them before. There's not a quick answer. There's not a quick fix. You look and say, this one is a life-changing trial, and I need to really be sure that I'm ready to handle this. And you see, God is committed to bringing us through those things, but He's committed to making sure we're ready for it. And you see, in the end of the day, they weren't ready for the quick fix. He knew the Philistines would wipe them out. They'd be begging, put us, please put us in slavery. But that wasn't what God had for them. And so God brings them the long way. And as they're going through the long way, God's building his character in them. And ultimately, what God is teaching them, he's teaching them how to trust. He's teaching them that no matter what's going on around you, there's something much bigger that God's doing inside of you. And we see that played out in the lives of the people. And I want you to know that if God has to put a delay on your dream so that your dream doesn't destroy you, he will do that because, as we sang before, his love is fierce towards you. You see, God is more committed to you than your dream. It's not that, he's not, it's not that he doesn't care about your dream. It's not that he doesn't care about your goals, but he's committed to you. 
And if God has to slow things up and bring you the long way around the wilderness to make sure that that dream doesn't destroy you, he's committed to that because he loves you. And we see him doing that in the children of Israel, and I think we see him continuing to do that in the lives of the people today. And so they begin the journey by way of this long, hard wilderness. But, but God doesn't, God doesn't um, make them question all along the way whether they're going in the same direction. I love what God does is he provides a, a cloud by day and a fire by night. It's like, if you ever wonder, you know, children of Israel, if you ever wonder which way you're supposed to be going during the day, follow the cloud. During the night, follow the fire. God made it very clear to them. And you see, here's what we need to remember, that when God is calling you to do something, he will bring some some clarity to the direction he's calling you to go. Once we are willing to let go of all of our preconceived ideas of what it should be and how long it it should take and what it should do, what we should do, if we're willing to kind of throw that all at the feet of, of, of God, he will speak with clarity, with a cloud by day, fire by night, or whatever he needs to, to speak direction into your life. I'm sure the people were encouraged and blessed that God spoke with such clarity. I'm sure they were really pumped up that, man, we've got, man, Moses is the man. Moses is the leader. We love Moses. They love Moses, but then something happened. As we move into chapter 14, we see something, a little, another shift in the heart of the king. Look with me at verse five of chapter 14. And when the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, I thought he released them, by the way. You see, he was so frustrated, he didn't realize what he said. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed towards the people, and they said, what is this we have done? That way we have let Israel go from serving us. I love that. Can you imagine, like, one day, like it was like all of a sudden, this, the, the children of Israel that had been serving for them, taking care of them, cleaning up after them, doing their chores, making their life an absolute resort, they're gone. And the Pharaoh was like, whoa, 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 wait, wait a minute. Where'd they go? Who let that happen? I did? Well, go get them. Go bring them back. And that's exactly what he does. He realizes we can't live like this. Go get those Jews and bring them back to Egypt. And he sends the armies and the chase begins. It says in verse nine, and the Egyptians pursued them all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army and overtook them and camped at camped the sea. Verse 10, when Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them and they feared greatly and the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. Could you imagine what's going on in the hearts and minds of the children of Israel? They're just, they're just celebrating their freedom. We finally got the approval to get out and go. And so they're going and they look and they say, who's that army going after? What, what happened? Why the change again? And it says, and they said to Moses, I love this, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you brought us out here to die in the wilderness? <laughs> Moses, wait a minute, Moses. So I guess the reason you took us out of the the comforts of slavery is because they didn't have enough graves to bury us in Egypt. So you brought us out to the wilderness to kill us here. They said to Moses, what have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Oh, I love this. There's a whole message in that. Moses, what have you done to us to bring us out of Egypt? Is this not what we said to you in Egypt? Didn't you listen to us when we complained and whined and questioned and and rebuked and gossiped about? Didn't you listen? This is what we said. We said, leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. Wasn't that bad? I mean, yeah, we cried and we lost our firstborn and we, you know, our whole world revolved around, but it wasn't really that bad for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to than die in the wilderness, would it? And Moses said to the people, I love that, such leadership in Moses. 
We see Moses literally taking the chin of the people of Israel and lifting it up higher than their circumstances. And he says to them, he says to them, fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord which he will work for you today. He's like, God wants you to see something bigger than the, children, than the Egyptians coming after you. God wants you to see something bigger than the obstacles. God wants you to see something bigger than what you're seeing around you. He says, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord your God. Don't get caught up in the little minutia like Egyptians. He says, for the Egyptians who you see today, I love this, you'll never see him again. Now Moses had no idea what that was going to look like. But he's saying to them, God wants to show you something bigger than your current problem. God wants to show you the salvation of the Lord your God. You see, the people were all caught up with what they could see. God wanted them to see the salvation of the Lord. And you see, you don't experience God saving you from something until you find yourself in a position where you need to be saved. You don't experience him as your deliverer until you're in a position where you're crying out for deliverance. You don't come out with a message unless you've been through a mess. And you see, God, because of his love, his fierce love for you, he will bring you through all of that so that you'll come out the other side, loving him more and trusting him more. And the Hebrews are about to experience that very thing because as the Egyptians are in hot pursuit behind them and the mountains are standing really tall beside them, they are coming face to face with another obstacle called the Red Sea. Now, unfortunately, I recognize that you know what's about to happen. But if you could put yourself in the sandals of the, of, the, of the children of Israel that day, they were surrounded. They, they, were, they, were in, they were in a situation. They were being chased from behind, walled in on the sides, and now they've got this obstacle before them. Do you ever feel that way? That no matter where you turn, it seems like it's not the right solution? You know you have to make a decision you know you need to choose well. You know it's going to be a life-changing decision. But when you consider all of your options, they all stink. That's kind of like, they're like, all right, we're either going to swim, we're either going to get destroyed, or we're either going to die in the mountains. You know what happens? God gives them the go forward. My people don't go backwards. My, my people don't go to the sides you go in the direction I've called you to go. And it says in verse 21, and then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land and the waters were divided. And as the children of Israel went across the Red Sea, they crossed it over on dry land. And once they got over to the other side, and the Egyptians who were in hot pursuit behind them, as they made their way through, God clicked the switch and the Red Sea wiped them all out. Those Egyptians who you see today, you'll never see again because God's going to flush them out of your situation. You see, once again, God, he not only protects the Jews, we, we need to see beyond the obvious. He doesn't only protect the Jews, he shows them that they can trust him. That's what he's calling them to. He's calling them to not a life of just seeing God manifest the miraculous before them. He is calling them to see the miraculous as one of the tools, as one of the means to communicate to them that I love you and you can trust me. God didn't only push back the waters. He pushed back against their excuses 
for not trusting him. He was using the tool of the miraculous to communicate what is the longest journey ever. Bringing us from that moment of faith to trust. Faith takes place here, trust takes place here. And sometimes that is the longest journey ever. I believe God can come through. I believe God can open the waters. I believe God can meet the needs. I believe God can do the miraculous. I just don't trust he'll do it for me. And when he's communicating to the children of Israel, indeed what he is communicating to you and me today is this, aware, this journey that he's bringing us on and bringing us from faith to trust, to move from I believe God can to I trust that he will. And if you're anything like me, you have a lot, it's a lot easier for you to trust God to come through for somebody else than it, than it is for me to trust that he'll come through for, for me. You see, I can, I can encourage and counsel and preach anyone out of a trial, but when I'm in the middle of it, there must be something else going on. And what God is doing is he's, he's bringing us through that long journey of faith to trust, and we see that happening with the children of Israel, we see that happening with the disciples, and we see that happening with us. The means by which he does that are irrelevant. Now, that doesn't mean that God doesn't care about the circumstances, but listen, he's over the circumstances. He's in control of the circumstances. The circumstances aren't gonna take you out. He's not gonna bring it, listen, he's not gonna bring it to the land of the Philistines if he thinks it's gonna take you out. He's not gonna bring you through a trial that he knows is gonna wipe you out and destroy your faith. He's not gonna do that. He's gonna bring you to a place where when he does bring you to that place, you're gonna be ready and you're gonna stand firm and you're gonna look past the immediate and recognize God's gonna come through. That's what he did with Job. What, Job, what was Job's cry out? I know my Redeemer lives as he went through the storm it's the longest journey ever. In 15, chapter 15, they, they respond in, in song of, of God's goodness. Do you remember, remember the song? I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and rider thrown into the sea. And we used to add cur plunk splash. Anybody remember that? Yeah. I asked Pastor Tom, can we sing that this morning? And Tom, he looked at me like I had two heads and said no. Um, like we got some Jewish stuff going here. It'd been great. But they are singing about the, 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 the way in which God shows up big and he, he brings them through. It is a tremendous moment. Imagine what a boost it must have been to their faith and to their, to their awareness that God is going to come through for them. They recognize that, that they had a future and slavery wasn't going to be part of it. but they would have never seen God part the Red Sea if they weren't pushed to the edge of it and had to trust God to open it up. And you see, sometimes God will bring you to right to the edge where you're thinking, is this going to kill me? God, are you aware of what's going on? Do you see the Red Sea? Do you see the mountains? Do you see, God, are you there? Sometimes God will bring us right to the edge so that we might see the salvation of our Lord. And we'll walk away not only having seen the miraculous, but we'll walk away with a greater trust and love for the lover of our souls. That's where God brings us, how he, that's how he works in us. And so here they are, they, they've got another win under their belt. They've seen God come through for them again. Surely from here on in, it's gonna be some smooth sailing for the, the children of Israel. Look with me, verse 22 of chapter 15. And then Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea, can't stay there, and they went into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and they found no water. 
And they came to Marah. And then when they came there, they could not drink the water of Marah because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Marah, which Marah means bitter in the Hebrew. And so really, now they just had this wonderful experience of God's protection, God's provision, God's care, God's love. They head on out. And after three days, they have no water. They're thirsty. They're depleted. They're dehydrated. And they're starting to doubt again. Verse 24 says, and the people grumbled against Moses, because it's Moses' fault, saying, what shall we drink? Moses. It's like amazing how quick we are to forget what God has done for us. How quick we are to conclude I guess this is it. That's what they're doing. They're you, they're me. And the people grumbled against Moses saying, what shall we drink? And he cried to the Lord, I love this, and the Lord showed him a log. And he threw it into the water. And the bitter water became sweet. Could you imagine? I mean, they're, they're, they're journeying, it's hot, they're sweating, they're thirsty. One day, they're like, all right, this is, you know, we got to do what we got to do. Day number two is like, I'm getting a headache. I'm really, this isn't, this isn't good. This isn't looking, I'm not feeling too fresh right now. By day three, they're like, they're parched, man. They're, they're thirsty. Hey, wait a minute. Look, there's a lake over there in, by Mara. Let's go over there. And so they go and they jump in and there's like, ugh. The water's bitter. What kind of cruel joke is this? And so they complain against Moses. And what God does, he says, Moses, Go get a log. What's a log made of? The log is wood, right? Go, go and get a log, Moses, and take that log and throw it in the water. And the bitter water becomes sweet. I, I, there's something here we just can't miss. You just got to take a moment of pause. And, but to think about it, Moses, here they are. They're drinking. They, they, they can't drink the water. They're dying. They're, under, they're feeling like they're being under judgment. They're about to die. And God gives them a solution. Go and get a cross. I mean, a log. And put it into your bitter situation. Because the only solution for your bitter situation is the cross, I mean the log. And so when you take the log and you put it in the water, God takes the most bitter times of our life and he turns them and makes them sweet. We can't miss the Christology, the work of Jesus even in the Old Testament as that log makes the bitter water sweet. There the Lord made for them a statute and a rule. And there he tested them. And he said this to them, if you, will dig- if you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God, and if you will do what is in his, right in his eyes and give ear to his commands and keep all of his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord your healer. Isn't that beautiful? He's saying, you are not going to be under the curse that the Egyptians were in. And here we are, the scripture says, we were born dead in our trespasses and sins. We were born separated from God. We were born, as John says, under the wrath of Almighty God. We are as bad off as we possibly can be positionally. Everybody say positionally. I didn't just say you're a bad person. I just said you're not good enough. Right? Right? Positionally, we are as bad off as we possibly can be. Our, the, the, the well of our soul is bitter. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And he took, the, he took the cross and he applied it to the bitterness of our situation. And he made it sweet for us. And they came to Elam where there were 12 springs of water. How refreshing. It even sounds refreshing the way the author writes it. And if that wasn't good enough, Dad, there were 70 palm trees. <laughs> 70 palm trees. And they encamped by the water. Sure they did. They lapped that up like dogs on a hot, thirsty day. They came to Elam. And there were 12 springs of water and 70 palms. 
and they encamp there by the water. Once again, they suffer unintended setback, but they suffered a very necessary setback. They go from singing about the, the greatness of God and their leader, Moses, to going back to grumbling and questioning. I, I love the irony here. They're, they're, they're confronted with drinking something that was resident in their own heart, bitterness. You see, the goal, wasn't, the goal wasn't to get them to drink of the fresh springs. God could have just very easily brought them there. We saw the way in which he, he led them in ways that they were ready for. God could have very easily brought them to, to Elam right away, but here's the thing. They had to go through Mara first because Mara was a place of bitterness. Mara... Mara was a place of, of discouragement. I mean, they've been on a journey, man. They, they're tired. They're, they're looking for a break. Mara was a, was a place of disappointment. Have you ever been there? Have you found yourself saying, I never thought I'd be where I am now? This isn't what I signed up for. Mara was a place of disappointment. Mara was a place of, of depression. They weren't experiencing what they thought they were going to be experiencing. Mara was a place of difficulty. But Mara was a necessary pathway to get them from where they were to where God wanted them to be because Mara was a tool in the hands of God to teach them that they can trust God for everything. If they went straight to Elam and drank of the springs, they would have never experienced the ability to trust God for even those things. They're bitter times, they're discouraging times, they're disappointing times, they're depressed times. Sometimes God will bring us through Mara to learn how to trust him. Mara will not destroy you. Mara might make you want to be destroyed, like take me out now, Jesus. But Mara will not take you out. God will not lead you down a path that his grace cannot keep you. But it will bring us right to the edge of the Red Sea where we think, I guess this is it. Imagine being the first line going across. God will bring us there. Why? Because he who began a good work in you, he will complete it unto the day of Jesus Christ. You're his workmanship, Paul says to the church at Ephesus. And you see all of, the, all of that, what's going on around us, they are tools in the hands, and I'm not making light of it, I know some of you are really going through it. But God is using those things to let you know you can trust him. You know, the Jews experienced freedom and slavery and freedom. They were, they, see, they, went, they kept going back and forth. Till this very day, the Jews have still not experienced their full freedom. And you know, sometimes we need to throw the timeline away as far as when God should show up. I'd love to tell you that once you get it, your situation's gonna change. I just don't know that. But you know what? We're on a journey that doesn't end at the grave for us. Our ultimate freedom, our ultimate reunion is about, is, is ahead of us. And so that might not be very comforting to you, but here's, here's what I, I need, we need to remember. We, we weren't born for here. We're born for where we're going. And in the expanse of all eternity, this little arena called time that we find ourselves in for this very short amount of time, is a blip on the screen for all of eternity. There will be a day that you will step out of time and into eternity and you will stand before the lover of your soul. And after your journey is over and your cries and your tears have been shed, he will look at you and he'll say, well done, you good and faithful servant. 
Hold on to him through that. Leave the outcome and the timeline to him. But that which is before you, use that as a tool to learn how to trust him for your day to day. May God give us grace to do that. Father, thank you for your word. Father, I recognize that there are many here that, that find themselves even now sipping at the water of Mara, waiting for deliverance. I pray great grace upon your people. We recognize your sovereign hand over your people and in the timing. And so, Lord, when we don't understand your ways, we choose to appreciate and look at your heart, your heart that is bigger than anything that's going on around us. And so, Father, I pray great grace upon your people today. Help us to rise above the circumstances. Help us to see the salvation of our Lord. And help us to honor and glorify you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.